buang sampah di merata-rata tempat khususnya lidi-lidi yang boleh membahayakan pemain bola di atas padang utama stadium. Terima kasih. Well, Kuantan Darunaim, now it is your turn to show the gratitude of warm welcome of the true Kuantanese hospitality and tonight we hold on and stand together in the name of unity of our Ummah to bring message to the world that Islam is high and nothing is higher than that. Our gathering tonight reflects our solidarity to Dr. Zakir Naik and we stand with Dr. Zakir Naik Respected brothers and sisters, I am truly honored to welcome our dear brother Dr. Zakir Naik to deliver his talk on the topic of Islam for you. Kelantan Darul Naim, please join me in hands to welcome brother Dr. Naik, Kota Baru, with you respect, I present to you. Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalam Ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi jmin Amma ba'd A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wa kul jahal haq wa zaak al-batil Inna al-batil akana ashaw Rabbi shali sadri Wa yassir li amri Wa hannu al-ahudatan min lisani yafqa wa kawli My respected Chief Minister of Lantan My respected leaders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be invited by the Chief Minister of Klantan, Ustad. Dr. Ahmad Yaqub and it was my desire to come to Klantan. I visited most of the states of Malaysia and it was my desire to visit Klantan and Alhamdulillah I'm really delighted and happy to be amongst all of you. The topic of this evening's talk of mine is Islamophobia. Before we discuss the topic, let us discuss the etymology of Islamophobia. What is the meaning of the word Islamophobia? To the word Islam, there is a suffix phobia. Phobia means an extreme or irrational fear or aversion. Thus Islamophobia means an extreme or irrational fear towards Islam or an extreme or irrational aversion towards Islam. According to the Webster Dictionary, Islamophobia means and Irrational fear
understand the timeline of this word Islamophobia, it was first used in the early part of the 20th century. But it re-emerged as a new word in the 1970s and the use became more frequent in 1980s and 90s. And after 2000, it became very commonly used, especially after 9-11. For understanding the complete word, the meaning of the complete word Islamophobia, Islam is derived from the Arabic word Silm, which means to submit your will to God. It's also derived from the Arabic word Salam, which means peace. So Islam in short means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Islamophobia means an irrational fear against peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. In short, Islamophobia means fear against peace. Irrational fear against peace. My question to you is that can any human being in the world have a rational fear against peace? Can any human being in the world have a rational fear towards peace? And the answer is no. But I personally disagree that there may be a small minority of people who may have a rational fear against peace. And I'll give you a few examples. There may be a very small percentage of human beings, 0.00001%, who may have a rational fear against peace. For example, there may be some countries, or some institutions, or some organizations, or some companies, or some individuals who may be involved in manufacturing arms, weapons. So for such people, if there is peace in the world, their business will go in loss. So their duty is to see to it that peace doesn't prevail in the world, so that they can supply their weapons and arms. So to see to it that peace does not prevail, they can even spend millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to instigate a war so that they can sell their weapons. They are a minority, but rationally for them, they fear peace because they will go in loss in business. And you can give several examples, I'll just give you one. Just before the elections took place, of one of the most powerful countries in the world, USA, more than two years back, Hillary Clinton, who was one of the candidates who was standing to become the president of USA, she openly proclaimed in an interview that my predecessor, that means the previous president of USA, they spent eight billion dollars in creating Al-Qaeda and Taliban so that USA can have a proxy war against Russia. So for the ulterior benefit, what do they do? They spend eight billion dollars. That is more than 32 billion ringgits in funding, training, creating Al-Qaeda and Taliban so that they can have a proxy war against Russia. Who says this? Hillary Clinton. Dr. Zakir Naik is just quoting. And when the purpose is fulfilled, when they cannot get what they want from these people, then they start calling them as terrorist organizations. Let me give you one more reason. There may be some countries 
some organization, some institution. What do they do? They give a dog a bad name and they hang him. This is an idiom in English. To give a dog a bad name and hang him, that means you lay an allegation against an innocent person or an innocent organization or an innocent country, malign him, criticize him, defame him, then do what you want to do with him. You can kill him, you can hang him, you can rob him, no problem. And this is what USA and UK did to Iraq, which was the strongest Muslim country at that time, in the early part of 2000. So Iraq, they attacked. USA and UK, they told that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. And along with other countries, USA, UK, Australia and Poland, they have a coalition and they attack Iran saying they have weapons of mass destruction and they kill thousands of people and by the embargo and sanction, they kill more than a million people from Iraq. They create a fear psychosis and Islamophobia and show to the world that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Most of the top countries in the world have weapons of mass destruction. USA, Russia, China, France, UK. So why can't a Muslim country have? But the fact is, Iran did not have any weapons of mass destruction. And the full world was just watching. Many people objected, but these superpower, they don't care about anyone. Alhamdulillah. The first country that officially in the court of law proved that they were wrong. Kuala Lumpur war tribunal crime. It was formed by Thun Dr. Mahathir, who once again is the prime minister of this country. And I always appreciate he's one of the few Muslim leaders who can call a spade a spade and who has got guts. He held a jury. He's the chairman of this organization. There were five judges and he called international lawyers and he sent a letter to USA and UK that if you want to send your lawyers, you send, they did not send. And there was all evidence given, the evidence was given in front of the judges and international lawyers that USA and UK, they fabricated evidence about weapons of mass destruction and attacked Iraq. Iraq and killed tens of thousands of people, and with the embargo and sanction, millions were killed. This five bench judge passed an order that if the former president of USA, that is George Bush, and the former president of UK, Tony Blair, if they set foot in Malaysia, we will arrest them. No Muslim country in the world had the guts to say this except Malaysia, alhamdulillah. We know that we are weak, but at least our beloved Prophet said, if you can stop anything with your hand, stop it. If you can't stop with your hand, stop with your tongue. If you can't stop with the tongue, curse in your heart, you will be the lowest level of believer. We know that the most powerful Muslim country was destroyed. So at least Malaysia turned out to follow the second step of speaking out. And besides speaking, having a trial and passing a judgment against the former president and Prime Minister of USA and UK. Later on, 
This judgment was passed in November 2011. Later on, about five years later, in UK, there's an organization and they held a, a complete investigation. It was called as the Chilcot Report in UK. This Chilcot Report too, after five years, after Malaysia, that is about 13 years after the attack. The attack on Iran took place in March 2003. After about 13 years in 2016, and five years after Malaysia, they too give a similar verdict that USA fabricated evidence to prove an allegation that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And the report said $573 million was paid to create a video to fabricate the evidence. $573 million to create a video. What was the reason they attacked Iraq? Number one, Iraq had the most powerful army in the world among the Muslim countries. Number two, Iraq had oil. They wanted to have excess of the oil. So what do you do? You give the dog a bad name and you hang him. You lay allegations against someone, then you attack it, you do what you want. After that, Tony Blair came on the television and said, the worst decision I took in my life was to attack Iraq. I'm sorry. I am sorry. Three words. You kill hundreds of thousands of people and say, I am sorry. This is the second type. One is selling of weapons. Number two is give a dog a bad name and hang him. Third is, third reason why they justify the war on peace or war on Islam is after 9-11, by the way, if you want more details of 9-11, you can refer to my video cassette, Terrorism or Muslim Monopoly. There are many theories, hypotheses about 9-11. Time will not permit us to deal in detail. You can refer to my video cassette, Terrorism or Muslim Monopoly. After 9-11, USA and many countries, they said, we'll have war on terror. War for peace. When they were saying war on terror or war for peace, what they wanted actually is war not for peace, war against peace, war against Islam. And in this garb of war for peace or war against terror, actually it is war against Islam. Not war for peace, war against peace, war against Islam. What do they do? They attack one of the most weakest countries in the world, Afghanistan, and they throw cluster bombs. One bomb goes down, it blows into multiple bombs, killing thousands of people. Even if you agree with the hypothetical fabrication that there are few terrorists in a country, can you attack a country only for the few terrorists? And the answer is no. It's illogical. It's inhuman. You have several such examples. We have the example of Palestine. Our Muslim brothers in Palestine, they welcomed the Jews when they were kicked out from Germany. They said, Alan was silent, come and stay with us. What do they do? They keep on encroaching the land of the Muslims. They were a small percentage. In 1947, they take nearly half of it. In 1968, they take more than three-fourths, and now they are occup occupying most of it. And they call it Israel. And when the pal you know, imagine if there is a generous man who sees a traveler on the road who doesn't have a home, he says, come into my house, stay. After a few days, that traveler kicks the owner of the house outside. And if the owner, owner of the house 
is shouting, please give my house back. The traveler tells him, you are a terrorist. This is what's happening. The Muslim brothers in Palestine, they welcomed the Jews. Alan was silent. They kicked him out, and now they're calling them terrorists. Most, almost all the countries in the world are against, except few countries like USA supporting them. They are giving veto in the UN. What's happening? Nothing. Alhamdulillah, almost all the Muslim countries were united against Palestine. But now, lately, there are some Muslim countries which are defending Palestine. What's happening to Ummah? In Palestine, they are saying, we are doing war on terror against the Palestinians. The Palestinians are throwing stones. They are attacking with guns and bombs. We have the example in Rohingya, in Myanmar. If you want to eliminate the Muslims, only say war on terror. Very easy. Say war on terror. Say the Muslims are terrorists. Butcher them. Massacre them. The full world is looking, doing nothing. Mashallah, there are a few countries which are vocal about it. One of them is Turkey. The other is Malaysia. Very few. We know we cannot use the first category of stopping with the hand. So at least we are trying to stop with the tongue. Do you know today, I would like to ask you a question. Today, which Muslims in the world are persecuted the maximum? Can you guess? Muslims in which part of the world are persecuted the maximum? Can you guess? From where? Myanmar. Palestine. According to me, today, maximum that Muslims have been persecuted is in Xinjiang, China. Uyghur Muslims. Yes, Muslims are being persecuted in Myanmar a lot, in Palestine a lot, but in China, it is on different levels. At least in Palestine, the Muslims can pray Salah. Correct? They can say Allah Akbar. They can fast. They can read the Quran. They can get the contentment in their heart. They are being persecuted without doubt. But in China, they are systematically trying to exterminate them. If you know history, in the middle part of the 20th century, you know, a lot of part of Turkey was taken over by the countries. Some part was taken by Russia, and this part, Xinjiang, was taken over by China. They are actually Turkish people, Eastern Turkestan. They took over and they made it part of China illegally. And many countries are doing that. You can easily make out the difference. You can look at their face and tell them these are not Chinese. But, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed that land with rich minerals. It has got wealth. So China is trying its level best to see to it that Muslims are exterminated from there. And they started in 2015, according to reports. It wasn't known to the world. It came out, some of the human rights organization came to know in 2016, and it came out in the media in 2017. It started coming out. It became more popular in 2018. What do they do? There are two types of Muslims in China. One is the, is the Uyghur Muslims. The other is the Han Muslim. The Han Muslims are Chinese Muslims. They have problem 
but very less compared to the Uyghur Muslims. Because the Han Muslims look like Chinese, they have problems, but compared to the Uyghur Muslim, very little. The Uyghur Muslim nowadays, most of them cannot even offer Salah. They're not allowed to fast. They are forced to have food during Ramadan. Many are forced to have alcohol. They aren't allowed to learn Arabic. And if they don't listen to the authorities, they are put into concentration camps. The Chinese government says this is re-education. Re-education. Many of the Uyghur Muslims in these concentration camps, they are tortured. They are harassed. They are asked to give up the religion. They are asked to follow communism. And those that are outside, they are being tracked by cameras, by face recognition. And this has been leaked by the human organization. Almost all of them, they are non-Muslim organizations. So much so that one month before, in July, there were 22 countries that wrote a letter to UN objecting on the human rights violation against the Uyghur Muslim in China. 22 countries. There are about 195 countries in the UN. 22 countries wrote a letter to UN saying there is human rights violation in China against the Uyghur Muslims. And do you know, out of these 22 countries, there was not a single Muslim country which objected. All of them were non-Muslim country, mostly European country. Isn't it a shame? There are about 56 countries in the world, 20, more than 25% of the countries in the world, they have majority Muslims. It were 22 non-Muslim countries who objected to the violation of human rights in Uruguay. And when interviews were taken of some of the heads of states, and some did say that Muslims are weak, it will not benefit as much to object. To tell you the fact, they may be right. What they're doing if you did not object and kept quiet, they may be using the rule of the Sharia, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. The Sharia gives you permission in Islam, it's usul, that let a small loss take place to, to prevent a big loss. If you think by objecting, you will not get any benefit, but there may be retaliation, there may be problem in your country, and if you do not take the best or the second best option, or stopping with the hand, or stopping with the tongue, you remain silent. This, if the situation is like that really, that if you object there may be retaliation, and if you take the decision of keeping quiet, Sharia gives you permission. That among the 56 countries, no one had the guts. But 22 non-Muslim countries had the guts. Here the story doesn't end. The story which is really disheartening is few days later, 37 countries give a letter to UN saying what the Chinese government is doing is correct. They are not torturing the Muslims. They are not violating human rights. They are educating them. They are doing anti-terrorism. 37 countries. Out of these 37 countries, 15 countries were Muslim countries. 
more than 40 percent of the countries which supported China saying that what you're doing is right against the Muslims what you're touching them is correct it is anti-terrorism they were Muslims Alhamdulillah Malaysia wasn't one of them I don't want to take the names of the country which gave a letter because I want to wake up the Muslims by Allah's grace I meet the heads of most of these countries whenever I meet head of state my job as a Dai is to convey the message of Allah whether they follow or not it's in their hands I don't want to take the names because I don't want to embarrass them but my request to the heads of states of this country that our beloved prophet said if any Muslim is in problem it is like if one part of the body is in problem the all the rest part all the cells go to defend it this is the ummah if any Muslim he may be in any other part of the world he's a Muslim he's your brother in faith you have to support him how can you support the enemies of Islam just for a small benefit this is not permitted in the Sharia keeping quiet accepted we are weak you're keeping quiet you may be the lowest level of moment but yet you're a moment but supporting a kafir who is killing your Muslim brothers and you're supporting them what is happening to our scholars I am not a scholar, I am a Dahi. The job of a Dahi is to listen, to listen from the scholar and convey it to the masses. The scholar may be very intelligent, knows Islam. The job of a Dahi is to make it simple and convey it to the mass. I am not a scholar, I am a Dahi. And I told this two days ago. And I am telling it again that please don't exchange what are you doing for a seat in this world for power in this world for wealth in this world you're exchanging you're exchanging your seat in jannah and you're purchasing your seat in hellfire you're a very bad businessman the jannah is the true happiness and I gave the details in the first talk I gave in Klantan on the 7th of August, day for yesterday. What's happening to the Muslim Ummah? We are deteriorating. There was a time when the Muslims were on top of the world. When the Quran was revealed, the Muslims were looked down upon. It was called as Yomul Jahliya, the days of the ignorance. The Arab did the tawaf around the Kaaba naked. They were jahil people. Allah reveals the Quran and makes them the torchbearer of the world. The Muslims became on top of the world. Europeans called from the 8th to the 12th century dark ages. Dark for them, not for us. The advancement that the Muslims made in science and technology, it is phenomenal. We were on top of the world. Today, Muslims are in large number. More than 25% of the world population are Muslims. We are about 2 billion Muslims. But we are looked down upon. We are abused. We are criticized. We cannot do anything. Why? Because that time, at the time of the Sahabas, of the Khulfa Rashidin, the Muslims were close to the Quran and Sunnah. Today, we are far away from the Quran and Sunnah. At that time, we didn't have riches. We were poor. But we had the deen with us. Today, the Muslims are the richest in the world. We have the black gold. But we are looked down upon. Why? Because we are away from the Quran and Sunnah. I request my Muslim brothers all over the world. This lecture is being telecast to all over the world, alhamdulillah. Through the YouTube, which has more than a million subscribers, through my Facebook, which has 17.3 million followers, and through Peace TV English, 
which has 100 million viewers, Peace TV Urdu, 80 million viewers, Peace TV Bangla, 50 million viewers, and Peace TV Chinese, Peace TV Mandarin, 20 million viewers. All put together more than 200 million viewers, at least 100 million may be watching, inshallah. Here, mashallah, I'm told that there are about 100,000 people that have gathered here in the stadium. People on the ground, on the stand, about 100,000. But the message, alhamdulillah, is reaching to more than 100 million. Thousand times more. My request to the brothers and sisters all over the world is please come close to the Quran and Sunnah. Do not exchange the worldly power, the worldly seat, the worldly wealth for your seat in Jannah. Please don't. Recently, last week, what happens? The ruling party in India and the Prime Minister India, Narendra Modi, what do they do? From the Indian constitution, they delete Act number 370. Most of you may not be knowing about Act number 370. When India, when the Britishers left, they divided India into three parts. Pakistan, West Pakistan, East Pakistan, which later on became Bangladesh and India. Why? Because they wanted to divide the Muslim into three. So one third went to Pakistan approximately, one third went to Bangladesh, one third stayed in India. And later on, they divided East and West Pakistan, three different countries, let the Muslim side. Kashmir opted, okay, we don't mind joining India under the condition that we are independent. So in the Indian constitution, Article 370 says that Kashmir is independent. It will have its own constitution. It will have its own laws. It will have its own government. They may be in the umbrella of India, but they are independent. No non-Kashmiri can come and buy land in Kashmir. All this is mentioned. 70 years later, the BJP government, which is anti-Islamic government, what do they do? They want to scrap this. And only way they can do is by getting majority in the lower house and upper house, Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha. And recent election, they got the majority in both the houses. And they scrapped this. It is unconstitutional. And they made it into a union territory. There are some Muslim countries objecting. But we aren't united. And Robert Fisk wrote an article on 28th of February 2019, a few months before. He said that when I heard the news that terrorist camps are being attacked, terrorists are being killed, and the main center is being destroyed, I thought this is news of Israel bombing Palestine, maybe Gaza Strip, maybe Syria. Then he hears Balakot in Pakistan. India in February attacked Pakistan and claimed that it destroyed terrorist camps. Robert Fick said they may have hit rocks and stones, but to show the people. And the Prime Minister of India said there were clouds, so you could not see properly, but I ordered the Air Force, even if the clouds go and attack. Today, the radars, the clouds cannot stop the radar. So I, our Prime Minister is so scientifically educated that he thinks that the clouds can stop the radar. In which age are we living? Robert Fish says that India is against Pakistan being trained by Israel. Who's saying this, Robert Fisk? 
UK. And that came in the independent, independent newspaper in UK. I'm not saying that. And he says future there's going to be divide. That means now they are learning how Palestine was destroyed and overtaken by Israel. Now they want to do it to Kashmir. What is the Muslim Ummah doing? Nothing. Fourth way of how they spread Islamophobia. For the personal gain, there are certain politicians in many countries in the world, including the most powerful country in the world, USA. In order to come to power, they want to create Islamophobia for their benefit. And that's what Donald Trump did. More than two years back, before the election, he said, I will teach these Muslims and blah, 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 blah. Created a fear psychosis. If you get me to power, these terrorists, these Muslims, I'll do this, I will ban them, I'll do this. Created a fear. Do you know, according to statistics, I'll come to it later on, according to statistics, amongst the people killed in USA in the last 15 years, 15,000 were killed in violent, not terrorist attack, in violent attacks, out of which only 45 Americans were killed by Muslims. 0.3% of the killing, not terrorist attack, killing, were done by Muslims. Muslims are 3% in America. So 3% killing should be by Muslims, so it will be average. Only 0.3% killing, 45 Americans were killed by Muslims, only 0.3%. That means the non-Muslim in America are killing 10 times more than Muslims. 10 times. So who are you fooling? But the problem is there is no Muslim organization which is exposing this false Islamophobia. We'll come to the statistics later on. Many countries, including India, we know in India, the Narendra Modi first, he was the chief minister of Gujarat in the, uh, in the starting of 2000, 2002. There's rights, and thousands of Muslims are killed and butchered. A state supported riot. A state sponsored massacre of the Muslims. The lowest figure of government says 1,000 were killed. Some organization, 2,000. Some human rights say 5,000. Most of the Muslims killed. State sponsored. Why? To come back to power. And he won the election after that. He became the chief minister of Gujarat. Case went on. Initially he lost. Supreme Court let him go free. Then he stands for election in 2014. And he wins. Become the prime minister of India. Again, polarizing the Indians. The Indians generally, Hindus and Muslims are united. These politicians, they create the divide. Most of the non-Muslims in India, they love me. That's the reason when I give a talk, 25% of the audience are non-Muslims. But these politically motivated people, they don't want Hindus and Muslims to unite. So what do they do? They create a divide. Do you know Modi in this new election that took place a couple of months back? In April and May 2019, in, his, in a span of less than two minutes, he takes my name nine times to come back to power. Imagine taking the name of Dr. Zakir Naik, sorry, Dr. Jakir Naik. Nine times in less than two minutes to come back to power. I did not know that I was so popular in India. I know, Alhamdulillah, I'm popular but not so popular 
that for a person to become prime minister, he has to accuse me, take my name nine times in less than two minutes to come back to power. Alhamdulillah. I never knew. In 2009, in the top 100 Muslim, in the top 100 Indians, I was listed 82. Modi's name wasn't there only. 2010, I was listed 89. Modi's name wasn't there. 2019, but naturally after that, my name is not there in the list. Modi's name comes in. My name is out. He takes my name to come back to power. You'll be shocked to know. Leave aside India, where I live. There are non-Indian countries where non-Muslim politicians take my name to come to power. I won't tell the names. You can do research. They take my name, they speak against me, then they become ministers. The judge, when they attached my property, in the lower court, they attached my property, when we went to the higher court, to the ED tribunal, Alhamdulillah, the judge was a Sikh. A Sikh is a person who wears the turban. Justice Manmohan Singh, he was the judge. When the Indian government authority said that, you know, Zakir is a terrorist, we want to attach his property, he said, I have seen many lectures of Dr. Zakir Naik. Show me one sentence out of context in any of his lectures, I will attach his properties. <laughs> he put a stay on it. Has I mean for therapy? He's an honest judge. He got pressure from the Prime Minister's office, yet he continued. Second time when they attached my property, again he put a stay. So which is important, allegation laid by Indian authorities or the judge of the ED tribunal saying there is no evidence. That's the reason when they approached the Interpol three times, all the three times Interpol refused. So these are the reasons why people, for their personal benefit, for their personal gain, they fear peace to prevail in that land, in that country, in that city, in that state. And they promote Islamophobia, an irrational fear amongst the people for their personal benefit. Let us discuss what are the causes for the Islamophobia. Number one, would be the 9-11, the attack on the Twin Tower in New York on the 11th of September 2001. Regarding details of this, there are various hypotheses, various theories. Want to know my views? You can listen to my video cassette. It's terrorism a Muslim monopoly. Number two, there are many terrorist attacks in different parts of the world done by Muslims or alleged to have been done by Muslims. So this creates more and more Islamophobia. Number three, increase in the number of Muslims in the Western countries. In America, in France, in Germany, in UK, Muslims are migrating, Muslims are increasing, Muslims are converting. So when the number is increasing, they get a fear. But this is a false fear. There are documentaries saying that within the next 20 years, half of Europe would be Muslim. I doubt whether it is true. They create these documentaries to create a fear. Like in India, they say, oh, these Muslims, they have four wives and they have 25 children. So if you let them live, within the next 10 years, they'll be majority. Nonsense. If one man marries one woman, there will be more children produced than one man marrying four women. Logic. If four men marry four different women, each one marrying one, and if one man marries four women, the total number of children produced by four separate men marrying four women will be much more than one man marrying four women. Simple logic. But they create an irrational fear against Islam.
The fourth reason is there are certain organizations in many countries, most of the countries, which attack the Muslims which are popular, attack the Muslims which are doing dawah, attack the Muslims which are spreading Islam. For example, in UK, there's a foundation by the name of Quilliam Foundation. Run by who? Muslims. Sorry, not Muslims, Munafik. Run by Munafiks. Calling them name, name is Muslim. Any Muslim die which is popular, they start attacking. Oh, he's wrong. And they call themselves as modern, moderate Muslim. There's no moderate Muslim. There's no word in the Quran, they're Muslim. There's no word like moderate Muslim in the Quran. Where does it say? Islam is moderate, yes, I know that. Ummat e wast. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 208, Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Where is this moderate Muslim come? I don't know where it comes from. Some of them may keep a beard, French beard like Salman Rushdie. Some of the ladies may wear hijab, some may not wear. Maybe they will pray only Jumma Salah or once in a while. These people claim to be Muslims, secular Muslim, modern Muslim. They are munafiks attacking the Muslims, attacking Muslim organization, attacking the Dais. There are other types of organization, UK, like Henry Jackson Foundation. They are non-Muslim. They are right-wing, right-wing Britishers, attacking Muslims. So there are two types of organization. One are the non-Muslim right-wing, attacking the Muslims attacking Islam, creating Islamophobia, and some munafiks. You will find this in many countries, not only in UK. You do search here, you will find here also. Calling themselves Muslim. They may not, surely they don't pray five times a day. All these people don't pray five times a day. They may pray just to show to the people. As Allah says in the Quran, they pray to be seen of men. Quran says that. In Surah Maun. They pick up certain verses of the Quran and they mistranslate and they say we are modern Muslim. We are secular Muslim. Where do they get this from? Which word in the... Islam is modern. And these people are funded by the government. They are funded by the government or by some anti-Islamic organization so that they can spread venom against Islam. And this is spreading even in Muslim countries all over the world. All over the world you find. And you find fatwas coming, oh Israel, very good, no problem, they are your friend. friend. Alhamdulillah. Yesterday, when I was invited for dinner, by the chief minister of Klantan, Ustad Dato Ahmad Yaqub, he started his speech. He started the speech by the verse of the Quran, and he said, Huwa alladhi arsal rasoolo bilhuda wa addinu al-haq li yuzhiru wa alladdine kulli wa lo qari al-mushrikun and my heart cried. I don't know Malay. I could not understand his speech. But when he started this speech by this verse of the Quran, sure Islamophobia is not in Klantan. I doubt any politician, Muslim politician, I, can, I don't know who will say this verse in public. If you know the meaning of this verse, this verse of the Quran is repeated by Allah three times. Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse number 28. In Surah Sabah and Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. Huwa alladhi arsal rasulahu biluda wa ddin al-haq li wa zhira wa laddin kulli wa la qalji al-mushikun. And Allah has sent his messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with wisdom and the religion of truth, so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether it be communism, socialism, atheism, Hinduism, Christianism, Judaism, Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulle, master them all. 
How much the Muslims don't like it? Literally, my heart cried. I know many politicians in the world, many of the most strongest country in the world. I met them personally. I've spoken to them for hours together. To recite this verse of the Quran indicates there is no Islamophobia in Klantan. I challenge if you request this verse to be recited in the UN or anywhere else when you give a speech. Most of the verses, they selectively recite. Today's speech, the Chief Minister started. From Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 33. Talking about the best profession of a Muslim Allah says, who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says, I'm a Muslim? The best profession, according to the Quran, is the profession of a da'i. That means the leader knows the Quran, mashallah. And that really touched my heart. And many verses he recited. And most of them, mashallah, are verses which are talking about dawah, talking about conveying the message, talking about peace, talking about like Rafiddin. When people do evil to you, repel it with good deeds. You may never know. Your enemy will become your friend. We Muslims get our guidance from the Quran. These so-called modern people, what they do, they selectively pick up verses of the Quran. That's it. The fifth way that Islamophobia spread is by the international media. Today we know in the international media, whether it be international radio stations, newspapers, magazines, television channels, internet, Facebook, social media, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. We'll come to the remedies later on. Let us look at the seerah of the Prophet. When we look at the seed of the Prophet, was there Islamophobia at the time of the Prophet? The word did not exist because English wasn't spoken in the Arab land. But the situation existed. The word Islamophobia wasn't there, but the fear, the irrational, extreme fear or aversion to Islam was there. We know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he started preaching about Islam, about Tawheed. His relatives, his people, the Quraysh, they could not take it. How could this man talk about one God? He gave the message, there is no God but Allah. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. That means... These Arabs, they, in Makkah, there were 360 idols. How could we barter the 360 for one God? We will lose business. And the message of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was getting popular. When it was getting popular, they were feeling scared. Rational fear. That if his message is, becomes popular, what did Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said? No Arab is superior to a non-Arab. No white is superior to a black. No, no non-Arab is superior to an Arab. No white man is superior to a black man. No black man is superior to a white man. No rich man is superior to a poor man. No poor man is superior to a rich man. All equal. They said, no, this man is crazy. He will destroy us. So they met him. And they approached him through his uncle. And they told him that we will make you the leader, whole of Arab. We'll make you the king. We'll make you the richest man in the world. We will give you the most beautiful woman you want. Only one thing you have to do is give up the message of one God. You agree with this one thing, 
give up the message of one God, we will make you the richest man in the world, the most powerful man, we'll make you the king, we'll give you the most beautiful woman. You know what was the reply of the prophet? Even if you give the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I will not stop this true message of one God until I die. And all of those who are popular, who try and spread this message, this temptation of wealth is there. Don't you think I was offered by the enemy of Islam to join them? I was offered. Just change your dawah style, we'll give you millions of dollars. But, the, but they don't know that my jannah, my two rakat of sunnah salah, my two rakat of sunnah salah before fajr is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. So what is a billion and trillion dollar for me? What does the beloved prophet do? His life is in danger. He does hijrat. They want to kill him. He does hijrat. People ask me that why did you leave India? I'm following the prophet. I'm no way compared to the prophet. The prophet is billion and trillion times better than me. I'm nothing. But I'm a die. Conveying the message of my beloved prophets, I have to follow him. And he goes to a place where people love him. He goes to Medina. I have come to Malaysia. But even in Malaysia, there were munafiks. There were munafiks in, sorry, there were munafiks in Medina. There were munafiks in Medina who called themselves Muslims, but they attacked the prophet. There were non Muslims who were against him in the neighboring part. So this is part and parcel of your life. There's bound to be people around you who will be enemies. There's bound to be people who will be munafik. And that's what Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 24, verse number 30, 31, that for every prophet there will be an enemy. So we, if you see the seerah of the prophet, there was a time, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, it's in Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, hadith number three, two, three, one. Her Aisha Radilawan, huh? she asked the Prophet that was the day of battle of Uhud when you lost the worst day of your life? He said, no. The worst day of my life was in Taif when I was stoned. He goes to Taif, our beloved Prophet, if you know the history theory of the Prophet. He spent more than 10 days, he spoke to almost all the influential people, all the rich people giving the message of Tawheed, all, all rejected. They rejected, they cursed him, they abused him, they even stoned him. They let the children stone, so much so that he tried to bleed. Another there, 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 and even he bled. Then they went a few kilometers and they rested. The archangel Gabriel comes down and tells the prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has heard what the enemies told you. He has sent the angel of mountain with me. And the angel of mountain tells to our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you give me order and I will bring both the mountains close and I will crush the people of Taif. Because Taif was in between the two mountains. The Prophet says, no. Don't do that. I would prefer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the children People who will believe in Tawheed in one God. Why? Because the Prophet was Rahmatul Alameen. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 1 and 7, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا أَرْحَمَتِ Alameen That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds. How could he kill these people? This was the life. When we read the seerah of the Prophet, we come to know the details. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 214, that, do you think you will go to Jannah without being tested? People in the past were tested with poverty and hardship. So much so that, they, along with the messenger with them, said, when will the help of Allah come? And the reply, unquestionably, the help 
of Allah is near, it is Kareem. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 5, hadith number 3612. The companions approached the Prophet Muhammad when he was resting in the shade of the Kaaba and leaning on his burd, on his cloth. And they come to me and say, there's so much of trials and tribulations, so much of problems. Why don't you ask for help? Why don't you ask Allah to help us? <coughs> the Prophet replies, the believers who were in the past, they had much worse trials and tribulation. A ditch was dug for them, they were put into it, a saw was taken, and the head was split into two. Yet they did not give their deen. They did not give up the religion of Islam, even after this torture. There were believers in the past whose bodies were combed with iron combs and their flesh was removed from the bones and from the nerves. Yet they did not give up their deen Islam. And you are in haste? This is what the Prophet replies. You are in haste. And he continues, there will be a time when a man will walk from Sana to Hadr al-Mawd, that's in Yemen, and fearing no one but Allah. As for the wolves, for the sheep. And you are in haste. That means the people in the past, what is happening to us today is nothing compared to what happened to our beloved Prophet and the Sahaba. We are nothing. The amount of torture they had to bear. If you know the seerah of Hazrat Bilal, when stone was put, he was tortured, he was a slave. He did not give up the message. Allah gives you permission that if you are close to death or someone forces you, you can even do shirk. The Quran says that. As long as in your heart, there is tawheed. The Sahaba told Bilal, Radiallahu tell them there is no Allah. He said, no, Ahad. There's one Allah. And when they went to, when he was being tortured, in the Syria, in the Syria it's mentioned, Abu Bakr, Radiallahu the first caliph of Islam, he tells his master, I want to purchase Bilal, Radiallahu Master gets angry. How can you purchase him when I'm torturing him? So he demands for a big amount. Give me 100 dinar. I don't know the exact amount, 100 dinar. So he said, I give it to you. The master is saying, you are a fool. Even if you had given me half, I would have given him to you. How come you're giving such a big amount for the slave? Abu Bakr tells him, you are a fool. If you had demanded double, I would have given that also for Hazrat Bilal. This is the status of our Sahabas. We learn from the Seerah. Allah tells in the Quran, in Surah Shara, chapter number 94, Alam Nashra, Alam Nashra laka sadraka. That we have taken from thee thy burden. We have expanded for thee thy breast. Alam Nashra Laka Sadra. We have expanded for thee thy breast. And we have removed for thee thy burden. And we have removed the weight of thy back. And raised thee in high esteem. So verily, with every difficulty there is relief. Verily, after every difficulty there is relief. So after you finish your immediate job, strive again, labor hard again, and turn to thy Lord. Here Allah is telling us 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has increased the breast and removed the burden from the Prophet. And he says after every difficulty there is relief. Whenever there is difficulty, remember the words of Allah, the words of Allah, the promise of Allah. After every difficulty there is relief. So whatever difficulties we have, Inshallah Allah will give you relief in this world. If not in this world, at least in Akhirah. Inshallah you will get Jannah. How do we reply? What are the remedies of the Islamophobia? Number one, it is the media, international media, newspapers, magazines, television channels, radio stations, social media, attacking Islam, virulent propaganda regarding Islam. Unfortunately, we Muslim, as far as media is concerned, we are backward. Media for Islam. Huh? Entertainment media, we are number one. In Bombay, Bollywood, which produces the maximum number of films in the world where I come from, Bombay, one third of the Bollywood is controlled by Muslims. Most famous actor, Shah Rukh Khan, Muslim. Salman Khan, Muslim. All Khan. Producer Khan, singer, producer, Muslim. Singer, Muslim. Unfortunate. Entertainment haram media, number one. Islamic media, last. Why? You go to the Arab world, entertainment media, Muslims are number one. Islamic media, miskeen. Toy cameras. They record with toy cameras. What is the solution? We require our own media. In 2005, we launched this idea. And we launched the Peace TV in 2006. Peace TV, Islam TV, promoting peace. MashaAllah, it gained popularity because of its quality. Our competition was with the entertainment, haram channels. We used the technology, but for halal reasons. And Alhamdulillah, within a few years, we became the largest watched religious channel in the world even more than the Christian TV. Peace TV High Definition in June 2009 in America was the first religious channel on High Definition. Christian channel first was in December 2009. We were the first channel, mashallah, that started shooting on 4K cinematographic cameras. When I came last time from India, when I got my lecture tour was to your neighboring state, Taranganu. We had got a crew from Bombay. About 40 people came with about 16 cameras. Film cameras at that time, Malaysia doesn't have these cameras. We tried to hire, we wanted two more, could not get. At that time, Sony is wondering why are we shooting this film camera? Because we want quality, not that we have money. Our budget is very low. But we have Allah's help. Quality. Then we launched in 2009, Peace TV Urdu. English reached 100 million viewership. Urdu, mashallah, 80 million viewership. Few years later, 2011, we launched Peace TV Bangla. In 2015, December, we launched Peace TV Chinese. The more popular it got, the more attacks came on me. It became popular. So the non-Muslim now want to close this channel. So they can't close it because we are legal. So they lay allegation, terrorism, hate crime. Hey, show me one evidence. I've telling them since three and a half years. Show me one sentence out of context in my speech, out of the 2000 speeches which promotes terrorism. Not a single article speak. Terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. Where is the terrorism? You know why? Because Peace TV is popular. Even now, maybe 100 million people are watching, alhamdulillah. They are trying the level best to close it down. We are, see, Allah subhan, they don't know that Allah does not require Peace TV to make Islam prevail. The verse your minister quoted, Allah doesn't require me 
Dr. Zakir Naik is rubbish. He can create a million Dr. Zakir Naik in less than a second. It doesn't require me. We are thanking Allah to make us, he is utilizing us to spread the deen. It doesn't require me. It doesn't require peace team. It doesn't require you. They, these people don't understand. What we are doing, we are continuing striving. And we are fighting legal battles in different parts of the world. Alhamdulillah. We'll continue till our last breath. How am I they're trying to stop it? You know, all these foundation, Kulim Foundation, Hendrik Jackson, they make videos against us. Against Peace TV. But in the court of law, it won't hold good. So we have the best of law. We are trying a level best. We should have more media channels. We should be supported by government, but high quality. Unfortunately, they should get experts. They should outsource it. If you outsource it, quality is better. If you have people who, are you, who you cannot tell much because they're part of the government, then the channel will not be good quality. Outsource it. You know, there are many Islamic channels all over the world. They come to consult me, alhamdulillah, about media, about quality. We should have more newspapers, more magazines, social media, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, Snapchat. I hope it's not going bumpers. These are all social media. We should utilize and convert the haram into halal. Utilize the social media, but in the halal way. Utilize whatever is there, but see to it, it's halal. Number two, they are trying to prevent Muslim dais who can prove that Islam is a peaceful religion from traveling. They are trying the level best to restrict the dawah. Today, mashallah, because of Peace TV, every day, hundreds of non-Muslims are accepting Islam. Hundreds. It is Allah who is giving hidayah. It is He who is giving hidayah. And not a single. Everyone that accepted Islam, we ask them, is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? Are you doing out of your own free will? Anyone giving you money? We are following the law of the country. But the politicians of that country, India, they don't want to follow the law of the country. We are doing our job. We have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the most powerful. He doesn't require us. They are trying to restrict the movements of the eyes. Recently, last year, Singapore prevented Sheikh Yusuf Estes from entering. Have you heard of Sheikh Yusuf Estes? MashaAllah, such a good personality, such a humble person. Can he promote terrorism? He's in his late 60s. He's close to 70 years old. Such a good person. They are saying he's promoting terrorism, cannot enter Singapore. Actually, they are promoting peace. They don't want speed to... They don't want peace to spread. Now, I make this statement, even I'll be man in Singapore tomorrow. Third, they are creating organizations amongst Muslims to create fitna. People ask me the comment, what is your view about ISIS? I said, what ISIS? They tell me, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. So I tell them, number one, I call them anti-ISIS, anti-Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. I said, why? Because no Muslim will ever kill an innocent human being. These people are killing innocent human beings and they're spoiling the name of Islam. They should be called AISIS anti-Islamic state of Iraq and Syria. All these 
organization, they are created by non-Muslim, funded by non-Muslim to create fitna among the Muslim. They create fitna among the Muslim. So that they can spoil the name of Islam. You know why? If someone is talking about Islam, about Khilafah, and doing things against Islam, people will go against Islam. I'm telling, even the Muslim media, and I told this to Muslim media in Malaysia also, so why do you call them ISIS? No, but that is the name. I ask them a question. Suppose, hypothetically, I say, I am the president of USA. So will you write in your report that the president of USA gave a talk in Clanton? They said, no. I said, why? Because they know I'm not a president. They say some lunatic is saying he's a president. Similarly, when Islam is against killing any innocent human being, Allah says clearly in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. So when Allah is very clear, that if you kill one innocent human being, you're killing the whole of humanity. And if you save one human being, you save the whole nation. I'm a student of comparative religion. There is no verse equal anywhere close to this verse in the Quran, whether it be the Bible, whether it be the Veda, whether it be Upanishad, whether it be the Buddhist scriptures, nowhere. Islam is emphatically clear that you cannot kill any innocent human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. So when Islam is clear, and if these people are killing innocent human beings, how can you call them Islamic? You should call them anti-Islamic. I tell the Muslim media when you report next time, don't say ISIS killed so many people. Say anti-Islamic state of Iraq and Syria killed so many people. These enemies of Islam, they are funding. And when you go to the expert psychologist, when you read the books in US, by U.S. author psychologists, they say most of these people, they are not Islamic also. They are doing for a political reason. Because they were harassed by America, which attacked Iraq, they want to take revenge. They don't know much about Islam. But the media is painting them as Muslims and Jihad. They, many people, for example, Assad, he kills them with chlorine gas. Their family people are being killed, so they want to take revenge. It's nothing to do with Islam. It is mainly political. Most of the terrorist organizations that are there, they are mainly due to political reasons, not because of religion. Whether it be the Christian, if you know IRA, Irish Republican Army, they are terrorist organizations. They are Catholics. But it's not, it is because of the internal conflict. Christianity doesn't say you have to kill innocent people. What we have to do, we have to identify such organization and label them opposite. If you, in your speech, start calling them Islamic State, they want to create a fair psychosis, Islamophobia. And most of us Muslims get trapped. So inshallah, in future, at least the people here, 100,000 people here, and the millions watching on the television, make it upon yourself that next time, call them anti-Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, yes? Oh no? Yes. yes. Inshallah. They utilize us to attack Islam. I'll give you some statistics. Time is running short. I'll give you some statistics. According, according to the statistics of the U.S. According to the statistics of USA, it tells that in a span of total 35 years, about 15,000 Americans were killed. From this 15,000 Americans were killed, only 45 Americans were killed by Muslims. This we are not talking about terrorist attack, normal killing, murder, while robbing you kill someone, while violent attack, not terrorist attack. We'll come to terrorist attack afterwards. Amongst the violent killing in USA, for the past 35 years, 15,000 people have been killed. Only 45 Americans have been killed by Muslims. 
परसेंटेज वाइज इफ यू कैलकुलेट पॉइंट थ्री परसेंट तो पॉइंट थ्री परसेंट ऑफ द मुस्लिम वकीलर्स परसेंटेज ऑफ मुस्लिम इन अमेरिका इज थ्री परसेंट हम इफ द एवरेज अमेरिकन दे शुड किल हाउ मच परसेंटेज थ्री दे आर किलिंग पॉइंट थ्री दैट मीन वन टेंथ द नॉन मुस्लिम द टेन टाइम्स बिगर किलर्स देन मुस्लिम अमेरिकन डू यू अंडरस्टैंड Oh, some people say no, no, no. America doesn't have three percent; has two percent. Okay, two percent. So it is seven percent. No, no. Some say one percent. Okay, one percent. Even if it's one percent, the non-Muslims are killing three and a half times more than the Muslims. That means an average Muslim is one third times than average non-Muslim. So who should you blame for the violent killing? Muslims or non-Muslims? Non-Muslims. according to shooting shooting tracking.com it gives the statistics of all the mass shooting in america they say in a span of 35 years 350 mass shootings took place how many 350 that means every year 10 mass shooting means they come in public and shoot many people out of this 350 mass shootings how many shootings were done by muslims only one so 350 out of 1 is equal to 0.285% 0.285% if muslim the 1% so 3 and a half times the non muslim the bigger killers if muslim the 2% the non muslim the seven times more bigger killers than muslim if muslim the 3% the non muslim the 10 times bigger killers than muslims in all cases muslims are below average so why are you blaming the muslims according to fbi report all this is available just google google will get the answer according to fbi report it says the threat to americans by the right wing white organization is multiple time more than the muslim terrorist in america yet trump is talking about muslims why for his vote bank if he says be careful of the white terrorist he'll be kicked out he won't win the vote will he win no that's the different question that the rig even in india i doubt whether the elections were honest they are elect electronic voting machines evm evm whoever you vote it will go to bjp or 80% to them 70% to them 60% to them they plan it according to fbi okay fbi they say people in america 100 times killed more than terrorist attack by police violence and gun violence people killed by police killing and gun killers 100 times more than terrorist killing people in america statistics on the global level it says that people that die because of misdiagnosis every year tens of millions that is thousand times more than people dying because of terrorist attack on average i'll come to it later 19000 people are killed every year all over the world in terrorist attack in misdiagnosis tens of millions thousand times more every year according to world health organization 6 million people die because of smoking 6 million people it is 300 times more than people being killed because of terrorist attack 300 times yet cigarettes are being sold in most of the countries of the world why tell me why if the government cares for the people it should ban the cigarette 300 times more than terrorist attack every country has a budget for terrorism counter terrorism in cigarette smoking the government earns money tax money why previously our ulama gave the fatwa that smoking is makru now there are 400 fatwas that smoking is haram and i've given a talk on that lung cancer smoking every puff you take you lose few seconds it is suicide allah says in the quran in surah baqarah chapter 2 verse 195 that make not your own hands the cause of your own destruction 
So I request my brothers here in Tlantan and the people on TV that if any of you is involved in smoking, please abstain from it. It's a sin. It is nothing but suicide. I'm a medical doctor. According to World Health Organization, two and a half million people die every year because of alcoholism, because of alcohol. The statistics tell 4% of the death in the world is because of alcohol. And the World Health Organization say 50% of the men in the world have alcohol, one third of the women have alcohol. That means 41.5% of the human beings have alcohol. If 4% is the death from 41%, that means all those people who have alcohol, 10% die because they have alcohol. If someone has alcohol, 10% chances he'll die because of alcohol. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maidah, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya you all the amanu, oh you believe, ennamal khamru wal maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling. And Allah continues, Ya all the amanu, ennamal khamru wal maisuru, wal nzabu wal aslamu, rishmanu min shaitan, fashtanibu lulukum tafliun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Allah says intoxicants, gambling, idol worship, fortune telling, these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from the handiwork that you may prosper. Everyone who has alcohol, whether little or more, 10% chances will die because of their alcohol. According to World Health Organization, not according to Zakir Naik. What does Allah do? Allah makes it haram. 19th major sin in Islam, alcohol. Smoking also haram. More people die because of smoking than alcohol. You know, in America, many centuries ago, they banned alcohol. The government toppled, so they brought back alcohol. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, by lips, he recited this verse, barrels of alcohol were emptied in Medina, never to be filled again, only because of one person, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is Islam. Instead of banning alcohol, instead of banning smoking, you want to control terrorists. Coming back to statistics, if you go to START, START is short form for study of terrorism and response to terrorism. They give the statistics of all terrorist attacks. When I read the article, in 15 years, from 2006, sorry, in, in a span of 10 years, from 2006 to 2015, on average, every year, about 19,000 were killed because of terrorist attack all over the world. Most of these are planned by the enemies of Islam, but I count them also. Most of them are planned by enemies of Islam, including that. On an average, every year, 19,000 people were killed in these 10 years. In some years, not a single person. That's in America, we'll come to it later on. The world statistics is 19,000. In 2012, which was the least, 11,098 people were killed. In 2014, which was the highest, 32,763 people were killed. Coming to America now. America, in a span of 13 years, from 2002 to 2014, only 61 people were killed because of terrorist attack. How many? 61, less than five a year. Less than five people a year are killed because of terrorist attack. And Trump wins the election because of fear psychosis. Are the Americans such big fools? Don't they go on the internet and see the statistics? This is from the American website, not my website. Less than five people are killed in America in a span of 13 years from 2002 to 2014. And they're spending billions of dollars on counterterrorism. This is fear psychosis, Islamophobia. Time will not permit me to speak about more details. I will just end my talk by giving a few guidelines. What should the Muslims do? 
The talk is very long, but I cut it short. I'll come to the last part of my talk. What should the Muslims do today? We understand. We understand. What should we do? People talk, oh, that country is not good. That is not do. Allah will not ask you what is that country doing or what the ruler of that country. Allah will ask you what you did. If some ruler of some country far away does something wrong, will Allah question you? No. Whatever the situation is, whether the situation is good or bad, whether you are in poverty or you are wealthy, whether you are old or whether you are young, whether you are being persecuted or not, number one, please stick to the Quran and Sunnah. Please follow the guidance of Allah and His Rasul. Follow Quran and say Hadith, number one, your life will be successful. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mul, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This is the test. Number one, follow Quran Sunnah. Number two, follow the five pillars of Islam. We live in Tawheed. Offer Salah five times, preferable in the mosque in Jamaat. Most of the scholars saying, Praying five times Salah in Jamaat in the mosque is compulsory. Some scholars like Imam Dahabi says, not praying in the mosque continuously a five times Salah, it is Gunai Kabira number 65. Alhamdulillah, for the last three days, I've been going to the mosque for the Fajr Salah. And if you want to test how good the community is, how Islamic they are, is go for the Fajr Salah. And when I went there for yesterday the first time, I was shocked. MashaAllah, 50% of the mosque is filled. With elderly people, middle-aged people, young people, children, MashaAllah. There were many ladies. I had heard that Klantan is Islamic. Now I give witness, MashaAllah. Klantan is Islamic. Secular people say, oh, prayer is between me and Allah. There are many Muslims who say, oh, prayer, me and Allah. Personal. What me and Allah? Fard. Number three, if zakat is due on you, give it. Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, number, verse number 60. The categories are given. In the month of Ramadan, fast the full month. If you have the wealth and the health, you have to do hajj. If you, if you have the wealth and the health, and if you're an adult, if you don't do Hajj, according to Adat Umar Radilawan, the second caliph of Islam, he used to put jizya attacks on the Muslim who was healthy and wealthy and adult didn't go for Hajj. At least once in a lifetime you have to go. Jizya attacks means non-Muslim. He was so strict. Fifth pillar. After fifth pillar, number three, do not do any kabair. Do not do any major sin. According to Ibn Anas, my love believe him, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Kabair are seven, major sins are seven. But Anas Radilawan, he says 70 is more closer to seven. There are 70 major sins. And the book written by Imam Al Dhabi, Kabair, it lists the 70 major sins. If you read that, you will come to know. Which are the 70 major sins? Number one, shirk. Abstain from shirk. Number two, murder. Murdering any innocent human being, second major sin. Number three, black magic, sir. Number four, not offering salah. Our beloved prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, the difference between kufr and iman is salah. If you don't offer salah, according to the prophet Muhammad, it is kufr. Number four, give the kaz if you have to give, if you're a rich man. Number five, fast in the month of Ramadan. Number six, perform hajj if you have to. That's number seven. Number eight, be obedient to your parents. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. We have enjoined that you worship only one Allah, 
and that you be kind to your parents. And if one of them or both of them reach old age, do not say a word of contempt. Don't say off to them. But lower to them your wing of humility and pray to the Lord. Bless them as they cherish me in childhood. You have to be obedient to your parents. You cannot disobey your parents unless they ask you to do something against Allah and his soul. If you are disobedient to your parents, it's eighth major sin in Islam. Breaking ties with your relatives and kith and king is the ninth major sin in Islam. Adultery is the tenth major sin in Islam. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, come not close to adultery, for it's an evil opening other roads to evil. Number 11 is homosexuality. Surah Hud says, do you prefer men in preference to women? Number 12 is interest is riba. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 217, 279, if you give up not a demand of riba, take notice of a war from Allah and his Rasul. Means if you deal in interest, Allah and his Rasul will wage a war against you. Third major sin. Is arrogance. Fourteenth is lying against the prophet. Fifteenth is running away from a battlefield. Sixteenth is a leader who is deceptive to his, to his subjects. A leader who oppresses his subject. Number seventeen is pride. Number 18 is giving false witness. 19th major sin is having alcohol. 20th major sin is gambling. 21st major sin, it is embarrassment of the property of the orphans. 22nd major sin, it is theft. 23rd major sin is theft. And it goes on, the list goes on. Then you have number 29, suicide. Then you have 30, frequently lying. Then you have 31, a person dishonest judge. 32, bribing. All these are major sins. You can go to my Facebook or my Pinterest account. All details are given in the reference of Quran and Hadith. We have to abstain from major sins. Next is abstain from minor sins. Minor sins is occasionally lying, you know, billeting someone, backbiting, so on and so forth. We have to follow all this. Follow the Quran Sunnah, follow the five pillars, don't do major sin, don't do minor sin. Spread the message of Islam to the non-Muslim. Convey the message of Islam to non-Muslim, number five. Number six, remove the misconception of Islam and try and reply to the Islamophobia. Number seven, help those organizations which are removing the misconception, which are doing dawa, which are removing all the Islamophobia. Number eight, help those people who are targets of Islamophobia. Number nine, do dua that we will be on the straight path of Quran and Sunnah. Number ten, do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can face this Islamophobia. Number eleven, do dua for those organizations, those individuals which are fighting Islamophobia. And lastly, do duas which are victims of Islamophobia, whether it be people in Palestine, whether it be people in China, in Rohingya, in Syria, in Yemen, in India, pray for them. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he guide us and keep us on the straight path so that we can pass this test. I would like to end the talk with the verse of the Quran in which I started my talk from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَذَاكَ الْبَاطِلْ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلْ كَانَ زَوْكَ When truth is held against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood, it's by its nature bound to perish. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ